Every week we do a Q&A with interesting and accomplished members of the adaptive community to find how they persevered, how they innovated, how they built communities, and how they found solutions. Welcome to the Name Tags Chat Podcast. Welcome to the Name Tags Chat Podcast with Chris Waddell. I am super excited. This is, we're breaking new ground right now. We have, we, we have Kim Crosby and we have Eric Hightower. Kim Crosby goes by Hightower when she's not working in, in a sprinting capacity. But uh, so these are two people who are both going to the Paralympics in Tokyo and they are living together. They've been married for two years, living together in at the training center in Chula Vista. So we've never had two people at the same time and, and we've never had a married couple. And, and so I hope that you guys are, are willing to behave yourself as we go along. And I hear that there's a bit of smack talking going because Kim is a bronze medalist in the Paralympics. Eric has won medals in the world championships, but Kim is holding over, holding it over him a little bit that he has not won a Paralympic medal. At least, at least this is according to what I've heard. Kim, th- Kim and Eric, thank you for joining us. Is that actually true? Is that part of the smack talk? To an extent, I think it's more, it is smack talk, but it's more just to motivate me. Like, you know, you, you can get this too, but don't forget, I have a medal. So, <laughs> so it's, it's definitely motivating. She, she doesn't let me forget, which is good. I work harder because of it. <laughs> Kim, what, what's your side? Because that's his side of it. I feel a bit like Jerry Springer right now. That's his side, but what's your side of it? Um, I try not to, I actually try not to hold the the Paralympic medal over his head too much just because I know the feeling of not meddling, you know, I, I came in fourth in my 400. And so like, you know, I, I do want to motivate him and there is like, you know, the smack talking there, but in terms of like that specific one, it's, that's a little harsh. Mm-hmm. So i am trying to tone it down just a little bit. <laughs> Well, it's it's really funny because you guys are at the training center, but you also you train together as well. And so so Kim is visually impaired in what's the T13 class. So so 2400 is that right and 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 if that's right, can you tell us what that means? Yeah, so 2400 is correct. So basically let's see if I get this correct. <laughs> Um, what I guess quote unquote normal people would see at 20 feet I it looks like 400 feet to me far away does that make sense did I did I explain that so that that makes sense to me that's Mm -hmm. what I've always kind of thought but I don't I didn't know if I knew what I was actually talking about (laughs) (laughs) so yeah it's I usually have to put things really close to my face in order to see them I do have a guide dog, but I don't run with a guide dog. <laughs> Which is amazing. So, so the, the T13 class is the, is the least impaired of the visually impaired class. The T11 class, by contrast, is, is what we would call completely blind. And they actually will wear blindfolds so that the, if there is any perception of light or anything like that. For those of you who watched some of the others, we had Lex Gillette on. Who, who is completely blind and puts his frozen blinds on before he jumps. But Eric is a wheelchair racer. So he is in the T54 class. You're both sprinters. So 100 and 400 meters. Mm-hmm. But, and so you're training together, but not necessarily doing exactly the same thing. How does, how does that work? So usually my workout is right before hers. So while I'll go down there about 20, 30 minutes before she does. I'll get my warm up ready. And so as I'm doing my workout, she's warming up to get ready for her workout. So then as soon as I'm done with my workout, coach can coach her in her workout. So we're, we're always down there at the same time, but not necessarily doing the workouts at the exact same time. And some of it, I mean, you talk about your warm up. you're doing your warm up, which in a wheelchair, you're going to go out and do like a two mile warm up, just like something easy with some pickups, that kind of stuff. Kim, are you running two miles before you do your, your workout? Oh no, definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> the most I'll go for a warm up is a mile. And that's what I've been doing in plus 
a whole bunch of dynamic drills to get my whole body warmed up. Well, you were in good company. I, I actually at one point was at an event with Carl Lewis and I asked him what he did in retirement. And he looked at me and he said, I don't run. He's like, I'm not a runner. I'm a sprinter. I don't go for a three mile jog. I am doing, but wheelchair racing is, is entirely different, but you work with the same coach, right? And, and Eric, I read somewhere that you said that, uh, that Joaquin is, is your, is your hero as well. So middle yeah. distance runner, Joaquin Cruz, gold medalist, world record holder at one point of the, uh, or not world record holder, right? Cause he, he never quite got, got co, but he was one of the few guys to go sub 142 mm -hmm. in the 800. So he's a middle 18, 800 and 1500, but yet he's coaching you guys now as sprinters. Yeah. How does that work and, and why the hero part of it? Um, before I came here, I kind of like just plateaued with my times. Like I just, I was, I was running good times, but it, it just wasn't changing. It was just kind of staying there. Um, so then I made the decision to move out here, train full time. And almost every year out here with his coaching, I've had PRs. I've, I had the America's record at one point. Like I've just been doing so much better. And, you know, a lot has to do with his coaching and, and just, everything so without him you know I, I, who knows where my career would have gone so how, how is an 800 meter guy translating in 800 and 1500 how is he translating to you guys as sprinters how does how does that end up working out maybe you can take this one kim yeah. <laughs> <laughs> actually he he tells us stories all the time and he would say like oh my coach would have me do this so i know exactly what you're going through and then, so I not dislike. Hold coach. on, but what, like a specific example. So like, like my coach makes me go through this. What is, what is he saying? Like, what is it, what did his coach make him go through? Do you remember? Um, specific example? Yeah. So it would be, it would be a circuit. So it would be a series of like six to 10 drills and we're running like 60 meters or so. So we run 60 meters, do a drill, run back. 60 meters do another drill so we do that six to ten times and then that's not even it <laughs> we do circuit and then for example we'll do a 300 all out circuit 300 circuit 300 that was one of my workouts this week so he said that his coach would make him do circuits but obviously his would be more like going I don't know thousand meters versus 300 meters for me so yeah, he had to do the, the circuits as well. <laughs> so it's not just the, because when we think about the sprinting part of it, it's not just the speed for you guys. You guys are building a whole lot more strength. How How is that helping? And, and Eric, in some ways, right? I mean, it's like wheelchair sprinting, so much of it in the 100 meters is getting out of the hole. And, and then how is that strength helping both like the getting out of the hole part but then also your last 10, 15 meters where we're different, right? We're, we're, we can still, like if we can get to max speed in hundred meters, that's an amazing thing. Whereas Kim's in a situation where from like 60 meters on, she's trying to maintain it as best she can. Eric, what is, what is that accumulation of strength doing for you in, in some of the important parts of your race? Um, yeah, I lost my train of thought. Um, I had what I was going to say, and then I just lost it. Um, might have to come back to that because I literally okay, we can come back to that. How about, how about for you, Kim? Because, because it looked like at trials you, you ran a great hundred, but it looked like the 400 was really, was really a, a better race for you in some ways, or better with, re with relation to what you'd run before. Is that fair enough? Um, yeah, the 400 is something that we've been working on. Um, I've come in fourth place in the 400 so many times and it's frustrating. <laughs> but um, it's, I would definitely say that it was a, the 400 was a good race for me at trials, but I have done better. I um, got my PR in the 400 in Rio. So, I mean, it's, it's definitely different engines to work on different muscles and 
um, between the 100 and the 400, because, you know, like you said, it's like the 100 is just all out sprint, but the 400, yeah, it's an all out sprint, but you have to kind of strategize a little bit better with the 400 with running that 200, not too, too fast. Cause you need that for that, the end of the race, the last 100 to try to hang on and still keep that energy going. So it's, it's definitely a work in progress for me. <laughs> that is for sure. So can, can we get back to, cause, cause we did mention that you are the first married couple that we've had on how how did this end up working how, how did how did this happen i mean can you can you tell us your story how, how, how did you meet did it happen at the training center this is this is where you guys are getting embarrassed it looks like eric wants to take this one i, think. I, I was gonna say which version do you want because i have a different version than she has <laughs> i want i want both versions i want i want both versions and figure out exactly which, which one of you is right <laughs> you so can go first we we met Technically, I met in coach's office. Um, we didn't really know each other at that point. Um, she was getting ready to go out with some friends at the time, so she was kind of dressed up or whatever. So, you know, I said, hey, you look nice. She didn't give me the time of day. She just kind of like, whatever, you know, <laughs> brushed me off or whatever. I said, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, you yeah, know, whatever. I'm not even. And then um, after that, we just kind of started talking a little bit more and more. And then, like I like to say, out of our group of friends that we hung out with, I was the only one that had a car. <laughs> ah, okay. okay. I like to say that because of my car and everything, you know, we kind of connected even more and she liked me more. I don't know. And then, you know, just one thing after one thing led to another and we started dating after a while and then we ended up getting married. <laughs> so that was, that was your pickup line? Can I drive you somewhere? Basically, I just had to start the car and it was, <laughs> It was game over from there. <laughs> you didn't even have to use the parking space part of it. You know, I get great parking too. I mean, I think that was a plus, but you know, <laughs> that's my version. She doesn't like that version, but I just, you know, it, I know it, it didn't really happen that way, but I just like to tell that story because it's, it's funny. <laughs> it's funny. Kim, what's your story? I just want to point out. He did say that he knows that that's not the real version. <laughs> it's, it's not, but I think it helped having a car. Let's we'll put it that way. <laughs> so I, I would say that, you know, up until like, you know, I did kind of brush him off. I said, thank you in coach's office, but um, we ended up going on a trip together to Canada. We had a meet in Canada that year and it was my first time out of the country and my first meet and so I didn't know anybody going on that trip and Eric actually helped me a lot on that trip and he guided me around and helped me out with since he was a veteran at the time so um, he helped me out and then we became friends in Canada and then we started talking I went back to school up in Northern California and we stayed friends and we still kept in touch and I think we became closer when I moved out to the training center at the beginning of the year in 2015. So that's, I feel like that's kind of how it all started. <laughs> and, and so you were, you were racing in college, right? And so Cal State Chico running scholarship, right? Mm -hmm, correct. Yeah. And, and, and both of you didn't really take to the sport initially. I mean, I read something, Eric, I don't know. I mean, hopefully Kim didn't have to go through this, but I heard that your parents had to bribe you. I mean, this is, yeah. this is written, this is throughout the internet. Your parents mm -hmm. had to bribe you, like financially bribe you? Yeah, yeah. I, it's because I was young. I mean, it's eight years old. You could play the Nintendo. You can, you know, you can do all that other fun stuff. Why would you want to go out and do something challenging? Like, you know, what kid wants to do that? So that was my problem. It, it was just hard. I was young, just didn't want to do it. So my parents just didn't want me to sit around the house all day. They're like, we want you to be active. So they're like, we'll just go do this one race. And no matter the result, I'll give you 20 bucks. Okay. Whatever. I'll, I'll do it for 20 bucks, whatever, you know. Would and you then, spend on Nintendo? Probably. Probably. <laughs> pro probably got new games and stuff, you know, <laughs> but then after a while I kind of caught on where if I say, I don't want to do this race or I don't like it, I'll get something out of it. So let's milk it for a little bit. So I'm not gonna lie, I, I milked it for a little bit, you know, got a couple animals out of it, got some more money out of it. But 
I think it was it was just a couple of years later when I finally won my first race and got that feeling of how it feels to win. And if you know, it just clicked like, you know, I can actually be good at this and I can travel the world, I can win tons of medals. I, I mean, I and ever since that day, it's been history. I've loved it ever since. And what was the first race that you won? Was it a hundred meters or was it a 10k or oh no, not definitely not a 10k. <laughs> <laughs> It was more than likely the hundred meters, but that was that was many many years ago. So it's <laughs> it's kind of blurry in the back of my mind, but I'm pretty sure it was probably the hundred meters. And Kim, it was a, it was a similar thing. It sounds like to you. I mean, you played a variety of sports and weren't really looking at running, but it sounds like you fell in love with it. Why did you Why did you fall in love with running? Um, I. So mine was, my story is kind of similar to where it wasn't, I, I wanted to quit the team before my first meet. And my parents told me, just go to your first meet, see how it goes. And then, you know, see how you do. So how old were you then? I was a freshman in high school. Okay. And so I was like, okay, fine, I'll do that. So I went and I ended up winning my first 100 meter race. And I was like, oh, okay. I actually can be pretty good at this. But the reason I fell in love with running is because I felt free on the track. Like I could, running gives me something to do that I don't need somebody's help to guide me or anything like that. Because when I run, I'm, I'm constantly like kind of looking down and following the, the left-hand side line. So the contrast between the white lines and the red track really helped me. So being able to run and be free and just almost like, I, I, I don't know, I just felt so much more like myself on the track. And I love that feeling so much. And then when I got a taste of the podium in 2015, then I was like really addicted to it. <laughs> that is awesome. Because I, I mean, that, that is, that's the Genesis story for so many people of like, how do you get how do you get involved in this and, and what's exciting? What, what draws you to it? I do have to, I, I'm, I'm going to go backwards a little bit because I do have to go back to the car part. Because Eric, you are, you are a car guy though, aren't you? Yes, I do like cars. Yep. Anybody who's looked at your Instagram is, uh, there, there are some cars in your yep. Instagram account. Parkers, sports cards and everything. I, I like it all. <laughs> Yeah, sports cars to Bentleys to, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. What, what do you drive and, and uh, what, what is the, what, what is the car, what does the car say about you or what would you, <laughs> actually, you know, what, you know what, let's, let's back this up. What would you be, like, which car are you on the track? Ooh, all the fast ones. <laughs> <laughs> you got to pick one. Oh, uh, you like the, uh... I like, that you saw in Dubai. Yeah, so we went to the Dubai Auto Show in 2019 when we were at World Championships, and they actually let me sit in the Bugatti, mm -hmm. and I was the only one of the whole car show they let do that. So, ever since then, I've really kind of fallen in love with the Bugattis because I, you know, I mean, I liked them before, but like, there's now like a special kind of thing for Bugattis now. <laughs> so, I probably have to say Bugatti. <laughs> so you're saying that you are a Bugatti, like if you have to. If you have to make that statement, yeah, I, I guess I could say that. Yep, this is it, the Bugatti. <laughs> and Kim, are are you on board with that? Are you on board with him being a Bugatti? I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> this might be grounds for some more smack talk on the track. I think she might be a little jealous because I don't. She didn't get to sit in the car, but I did. So you know. <laughs> I, I was totally million okay dollar car. <laughs> I was happy to see him happy. So. <laughs> but we we always say that we're superheroes. So he's Superman and I'm the Flash. And obviously the Flash beats Superman. So he he can have the Bugatti. I'm but, I'm the Flash. But super, Superman <laughs> is stronger. <laughs> so what you're saying is you don't need the Bugatti. As Flash, you don't need Bugatti. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> You just blink and I'm already there. <laughs> and now how did the how did the flash nickname come about? Where did you get this? Um 
my friends and teammates in high school actually gave it to me and it just kind of stuck since then and since then I like got all the t-shirts I have flash socks the and poster behind us yeah <laughs> flash poster behind us like everything it has been the flash ever since high school track <laughs> and I'm assuming that that's because you were beating all of them that they were calling you the flash yeah I in high school um we would show up to meets and <laughs> some of the girls I would compete against would see me walk up and be like oh well I guess I'm gonna get second this time <laughs> they, they would literally be mad that I showed up so <laughs> now what do you what do you run for a 100 camp can you tell people I run the 100 in 12.1 seconds 12.1 which is really fast which is which is worthy of, of the flash nickname <laughs> I'm, I'm working towards that that sub 12 that's what I was really going for at trials but apparently it's not supposed to happen just yet <laughs> well we're hoping that it's a little bit faster track in Tokyo that it will be a little bit less windy possibly than in Tokyo and we did see you on that trials track Eric with the Superman sweatshirt or t-shirt right yep, where did I that did. come about with who, who gave you that one so when we first moved here again our group of friends that we hung out you know we all had our superheroes so so david brown one of the blind guys he had he was spider-man um we had who else did we have austin pruitt austin was, was what was he batman batman so we just kind of all just kind of picked our superhero and i've always liked superman growing up and everything so i was like hey this is perfect at one of the meets in Arizona that he would compete at, um, the announcer actually gave you the, the title Superman. Yeah, they called me Superman at one point. So <laughs> it just kind of has always been around. Well, when somebody else says it, then it's true, right? Gotta be, yep. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's kind of funny, though, because you, because because you, I mean, looking at like inclusion and some of those things, I noticed a quote on your on your Instagram, where where you're talking about, uh, you know, you, the, you can be successful while being disabled, that, that it's not a matter of overcoming disability. What, what do you think about that, that whole idea of people are like, oh, well, you you've overcome your disability. What does that what does that mean to you? Or what does that say to you when they when they say that to you? I don't necessarily say that I've overcome my disability. I'm just using my disability to the best of my ability so it's like I'm, I'm always going to have my disability so i'm not overcoming it i'm just using it to the best that i can so that's usually how i explain it to people when when they say something like that well and, and it's it, it can be a hard one too right i mean we're, we're all in the same in the same boat where i think in so many ways people want to look at us and say well you've overcome your disability so in some ways it's like i almost don't have to worry about you right right yeah like you're, yeah. you're fine you're good you're good don't don't worry about it but it's also i think our society wants to think that we overcome everything that we that there's like a magic pill yep and and in some ways that that doesn't see the process that you're all going through where it's like no i'm struggling every single day to get incrementally faster yep. and we can call it a struggle but that's also also the exciting part is that I'm pushing myself to get that little bit faster. Yep. And, and what's cool is seeing you guys be able to train together. Is there a chance in the universal relay that you could race together? That would be awesome. It would but... be awesome. But I, so the, the way the relay works is it's two males and two females. So if yeah i don't know we have there's there's, there's other so people who like because um we have a vi male on our team who's he's pretty fast so <laughs> i'm i'm gonna let him take the spot i guess <laughs> and be on that universal relay but um it i think it would be really awesome 
for us to be on the relay together, but I think looking at putting the best team together realistically, I don't think we'll be on it together. And, and so, Eric, you won a gold medal at the World Championships in the first universal relay, right? So can you describe a little bit more of what that universal relay is? And and possibly if you know why why that is why, why that's come into being. So I heard about this relay, just talk about it. It was probably a couple of years ago. And I was like, there's no way this will ever work. How are you gonna throw wheelchairs in with, with runners and this and that? Like, it, it's just a disaster waiting to happen. Like, so honestly, when they, they asked me to be on the relay team, I was kind of nervous because I'm like, ooh, this is, this is a lot. And I don't know how this is gonna go. I don't, you know, how, you know, so. So it's a four like, by 100, right? Yes. Yeah, so, so it's a mixed class relay. So there's four different classifications in the relay. So you have, you have the blind class, you have the amputee class, the cerebral palsy class, and a, the wheelchair class. So you have to go in a certain order. So, so the blind class goes first, then they tag the amputee class, and then they tag the CP, cerebral palsy class, and the, then they tag the wheelchair class. So the wheelchair is always last in the race. Um, so I was just, I was up for the challenge. I was like, this, this could be fun or this could be a disaster. Let's, let's see what happens. And they threw the relay, they put the relay team together. They named who was going to do it. And we practiced it probably a handful of times the day before the race was supposed to happen. And we were just like, let's go do it. Let's go see what happens. Let's go have fun. And we ended up getting a gold medal and now we're super excited to run it in Tokyo. And so it's so so it's all four different classes. So as you said, visually impaired, CP, amputee, and wheelchairs. But it's also two men and two yep. women yep. in this universal class. And because the the relays traditionally, like the when when I was racing, we did wheelchair re relays where it was, you know, it was three three T fours, T fifty fours, the the more able of the of the of the paraplegics and and one t53 generally i mean granted there, there are times that that, that changes and we would do four by 100 and four by 400 and we tag so most people watching relays are used to seeing a passing of the baton but for for you in a wheelchair like that doesn't that doesn't work it's not like you can take the baton and like you know put it between your legs or something like that and and go along it's not gonna it's not gonna work so so what happens is you guys actually tag as you're going around. So, and there are three, three or four teams on the track at a time. Do you get two lanes a piece? Yeah, we get two lanes a piece, yeah. Two lanes a piece. And so so who do we need to talk to to, to get Kim on this team? <laughs> <laughs> I have it, no idea. I mean, it would be so cool, but it's like, you know, if, it, if it's meant to be, then it'll happen. If it's not, you know, I don't know, then it's, I guess it's not, but it would be really cool to at least one year be able to run, run it together, together you know, yeah. on a relay team somewhere. So but if it doesn't happen in Tokyo, maybe we can talk to coaches and doing it at world championships next year or, or somewhere else, you know, another year or something, try to get it to happen. <laughs> right. And you, you guys might have to go and recruit and get like a really fast uh, CP mail or something like that, you know, to start balancing these things out and, yeah. you know, really, really make it a, a, a challenge to get onto this team. So you can, but you guys are breaking, you're breaking new ground, right? I mean, are you the first husband and wife to live at the training center in San Diego? I think so. Yeah, yeah we yeah. are. And, and, and do they let you live in the same room or how does, how does this work? You know, are you, are there strict rules or how does it, what, what's going on there? <laughs> yeah. So they let us thankfully live in the same room together. Um, we do share a common space with somebody on the other side. So it's what happens is it's, um, it's one suite, but two rooms in one suite. So we share a common space with uh, two other people on the other side. So they told us that you guys are the first ones. Don't break any rules because <laughs> you guys are the like example for people who might want to do this after you guys so we were like uh oh okay we really got to be on our p's and q's but it 
it's no different from living here separately but um yeah it's it's honestly we were really grateful to for them to allow us to room together because we had just gotten married and they were like, called us and said hey you guys moving back to the training mm -hmm. center we're like uh not if we're going to be living separately we don't want to live the first two three years of our marriage separate so they allowed it so mm -hmm. we we're really grateful for that and now uh, did the dating all happen while you were at the training center is this yeah. prior to prior to okay so 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 what what was that like you know how how's this whole thing working out you know it's just it, are, are there many other people who are dating while they're at the training center or or were you guys kind of the only ones no there's no, there's, 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 a lot. there's a lot of people that date here yeah. so <laughs> you can usually tell the people who are dating but yeah there's uh, there's quite a bit of sneaking around too that's <laughs> happening <laughs> <laughs> oh they, they they're like we already know we can see your wheelchair marks going into kim's room <laughs> so i'd have to go across like this dirt path and it, and it was usually muddy because the sprinkles would like just turn off and she's like hey you want to come in here i'm like sure so yeah it was <laughs> and then they can see when when you scan in and out of your room so i'd I have to actually scan into my room when i came back so they they knew i was coming back kind of late you know <laughs> Yeah, we were. Yeah. <laughs> but. So, so is this is this the dorm parent that's uh, you know? Do you have to check in with the dorm parent, or how how is this working? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, waiting up for you, like, hey, it's it's two o'clock in the morning. What are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> no, just roommates. <laughs> Just roommates. Okay. All right. This is <laughs> awesome. So Kim, back to the, back to the racing in college part of it. Mm -hmm. What, how did racing in college prepare you for the Paralympic side? Does it give you more confidence having, having sort of raced on the able-bodied side? Yeah, it definitely gave me more confidence. Um, honestly, when I was racing in college, I had no idea about the Paralympics. Um, so racing in college, it allowed me to have that experience of racing other phenomenal athletes, other females that, you know, and now, and I go and race on the world stage. And of course I'm very nervous racing other girls from other countries, but um, I feel like running at Chico State helped build me up to that for sure. Stepping stone. <laughs> but you feel like you've held your own against some really good runners so it's not a shock exactly exactly it definitely would have been a shock if i would have went straight from high school to the paralympic level so yeah when Great. did you find out how did you find out about the paralympics because it seems like you had no idea mm -hmm. i um was at practice in chico and it was Kathy Sellers, who was the director at the time, who reached out to, I don't know how she found out about me. People talk apparently, <laughs> but she found out about me and she um, reached out to my coach and she emailed him and he was like, hey, I got this email from this lady. And so he connected Kathy and I and I got on the phone with Kathy and like one of the first things that she said to me was your time in the 400 would have gotten you on the podium in London. And I said, what? I said, sign me up. How do I get to Rio? Parents, get your tickets. Like we're going. <laughs> and she's like, okay, wait, hold on. There's some steps we got to go through first. And I was like, hey, you psyched me up about this. So, <laughs> but that's yeah that's exactly how it went down and honestly that was the best day of my life because the paralympics has changed my life in so many ways and i'm super grateful for that what, so what kind of ways has it changed your life i mean i have a husband here <laughs> <laughs> and he and has a car yeah it's a car yeah <laughs> he has a car you got a husband and a car that's a great deal <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> no, but seriously, what 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 are the other ways that it's that it's changed to uh, you know that it's changed who you are, or changed your life for the better? Yeah, it's I feel like shaped me into the person that I am, and I feel like I'm a better person just because of the people that I've 
met along the way. Um, my coach who has given me so much confidence that to, cause in, in college, I only ran the 400. I was recruited for the 400 and, um, you know, I was kind of told that, oh, you know, you shouldn't be running the 100. And my coach gave me the confidence to run the 100 and allowed me to medal at the games in the 100. So meeting him, meeting all these other amazing people, being able to travel the world, see the world and oh, alongside my husband, it's, it's been so phenomenal, <laughs> this journey. And I, I feel like I'm such a strong person internally versus where I was in college competing. That's a big part, right? It, it's because it's the sport thing. It's, it's going from running the 400 to running the 100, mm -hmm. but then taking that confidence from your sport to the rest of your life yeah. too. Definitely. Eric, you before, before Rio, is, is my chronology right? I mean, one, you guys are in this period of time right now, right? Where you're, you, you've made the team, you know you've made the team, you have some time to sharpen your sport and get ready for Tokyo. But wasn't it before Rio that you ended up getting your racing wheelchair stolen? Yes, that was, that was quite the experience. Um, so, I did a race in, so I have a bunch of family that lives in Ohio and I was racing in Indianapolis at the time and which isn't too far. So a lot of my Ohio family came up to, to watch me race. Um, my parents came to watch me race. And then the plan was after competing, I was going to go back to Ohio, visit family for a couple of weeks and, you know, just kind of take some time off before training again. Um, so obviously the racing chairs are super long, so they don't really fit in every single car. Um, so my cousin had a truck. He's like, oh, well, I'll, I'll take it back for you. I'll just put it in the back of my truck. He had the camper shell on the back, that, you know, everything. So on the way home, they had, I don't remember if it was like a friend or a family member that was in the hospital. So they stopped by the hospital, you know, just to visit for a little bit. And they come out of the hospital and find out that the camper shell is open like somebody picked the lock had to and the camper shell has like dark windows so somebody had to walk up to the truck look in the truck to see what was in there first so apparently they picked the lock on on his truck and took the chair so literally like right away probably maybe an hour after that all happened all my family members in Ohio, they were, they were calling the newspaper they were calling every single news station they were calling I mean they were calling the junkyards they were calling just everybody saying you know if you see this chair you know contact the police because it's stolen let's make sure this doesn't get scrap metal or or you know sold or whatever so it was gone so i actually had to leave and come back here because i was gearing up for another race i want to say and i had to come back here but so i was on the phone the day that i got the call that they found the chair I was on the phone with the chair company ordering another chair to rush out because I had to keep racing, you know, like, so um, my, my mom stayed in Ohio a few weeks later. Um, so they got the call. So my mom was able to go when they found the chair, she's able to get it and everything. And the only thing missing off the chair was my little speedometer thing. But, you know, I, I had probably a couple hundred dollars worth of tires. I had, I had a whole bunch of stuff because my track bag was taken too. And, all that was still there. It was just, just that little thing I was taking. So how specific is a racing wheelchair too? Um, it's pretty specific. Um, the frame itself is pretty standard, but the area that we sit in is custom made for our bodies. So when we get the chair made, they, they measure how wide your hips are. They measure how long your legs are. So when you're sitting in the chair, it fits your body type. It fits you like a glove. So so we were talking to like, like Kim couldn't really get in my chair and go push around too easily because it's, it's not made to fit her. It's made to fit me. You know what I mean? So it's, it's a very customized equip piece of equipment. So not many people can use it. So, so Kim hasn't been in your chair racing around the track. 
a couple of years ago <laughs> i had my other chair she she kind of sat on top of the frame because i was able know, to fit she, in it she kind of, fit, of. <laughs> but she did she did pretty good i can't say her form was great but she did pretty good <laughs> so I, of course i have a video of it and everything because you know it was, it was pretty cool it's very cool but but i mean to, to your point as well i mean it's not just the 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 length of your legs the width of your hips and and the length of your torso it really is also the way that you push so that you are you're setting up this piece of aluminum padded aluminum in places i mean granted yeah. the side guards are not padded the mm -hmm. fenders are not padded this is some hard aluminum yeah. but but really you're setting it up and so it's specific for you so when somebody steals your your racing wheelchair it's not like stealing a bike or something where there might be a market for it. I mean, it's a small part, a small segment of the population that could actually. Yeah. Every everybody in the racing community knows each other, so even if they tried to sell it, I'm sure somebody would have known. Like, hey, that's not yours. I'd know whose chair that is. So you know, so I don't think the person would have gotten away with it. So they ended up just ditching it in a random baseball field somewhere. They're just sitting out in the middle of the baseball field. Were you guys together when this happened, Kim, or, or were you not together yet? You weren't together yet. We weren't together yet. No, yeah, we hadn't met at this point. Oh, you hadn't even met. Okay. Did you did you hear about him as the guy who was the who had his wheelchair stolen? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I did. <laughs> Gotta be famous for something. That's that is <laughs> it got quite the press. Like I was on, I think I was on the Sports Illustrated website. Like it it made its rounds. It was it was all over the place i'm like wow like and it got to the point where because like i was saying I, I was getting probably four or five calls for an interview every day probably for close to a month and it it almost it got to the point where i just, i didn't want to answer the phone anymore like i was just sick of doing interviews about my stolen chair like it's bad enough that it's stolen now you just want to, me to keep talking about it you know and after a while it's like can't do this anymore like leave me alone so but I'm, yeah I'm, I'm glad at the end of the day everything worked out and it was found and returned and i was able to continue racing well which sounds like one of the biggest challenges that you could have right i mean this is this is it i mean it's not like it's not like somebody's stealing your sneakers mm -hmm. it's like somebody's stealing your legs yeah and and you're a runner so this is it you can't you can't run anymore what did you guys do because this is this is part of being an athlete right and this and this whole podcast is really about the sense of resilience and our motto is it's not what happens to you it's what you do with what happens to you you couldn't have predicted 20 2020 right you couldn't have predicted covid you couldn't have predicted that they'd postpone the olympics and the paralympics Kim, what did you guys what or maybe let's just talk about you specifically what did you go through? How did you how did you make that work? And what's the story that you have to tell yourself to be able to keep going when it seems so bleak? Yeah, it it was a hard pill to swallow at first. And at first, when I first got told the news, I didn't believe it. And it took a couple of weeks for it to really kind of settle in. And, um, and I was just like, what am I going to do? Like, I, I didn't know what to do next. Cause we were gearing up to start racing. It was almost time season for track and field. So I was like, I don't, I don't know what to do. I can't see my coach anymore. We don't have access to anything to train. So, um, then I made the decision to go home. Eric stayed at the training center and I went home cause he could still like train on the roads but I couldn't, um, it's not really good for us to run on the road. Um, so I went home and I started training there. And honestly, I was like, you know what, this is, this gives me an advantage. I can not only heal my body from the injuries that I had last season, but also take my time, get into the shape that I need to get in to really run some good races when Tokyo does happen. So I use this extra year to my advantage. And not only did I train really hard, but I had a lot of fun doing it. And 
I think that's when I really went back to how I felt when I first started track and field in high school. Like I just had fun running and it felt so good to be able to do that again. It's, it is funny, right? Because I mean, you, you go from starting in high school, then you go and have a, have a scholarship to run in college. And now you're effectively running professionally. So it's your job. Yeah. This is what you do. Mm -hmm. And, and you started doing this because you loved it. Yeah. But then at some point it gets to be, it gets to be work, right? And it gets to be worry about the, the injuries, worry about, you know, not, not, not worried about doing something that's going to affect your performance yeah. and, and, and losing that sense of fun. How, how, how did this come back to the fun? I mean, what does that feel like? And where, where did you get that, that revelation? Because I'd imagine this is something that's going to help you in your career moving forward. How do you keep from lapsing back into this is my job, this is what I have to do, as opposed to this is fun? Yeah, and I think what made it really fun is not having all the pressure behind it because I knew I had the time to just do my workouts. Um, and, and our coach at the time, like he wrote our workouts, but it was really, he was really relaxed about it. He was like, oh, like he gave us options. So I could do, know that I'm getting in shape, building up my body for what it, it needs to do, but also I can pick and choose what I want to do and have fun with it and do the fun workouts. <laughs> You could do the fun workouts, really. Does, yeah. does that feel like you're cheating on some level where you're like, oh, yeah, yeah this is, I'm going to do the fun one. I'm not going to do the one that, that really just hurts and breaks me down. Yeah. And funny you say that because I went through this workout that was so hard mentally and physically. And I felt like at the end of it, I dominated that workout. But then, as bad, like as beat up as my body felt afterwards, I came back to my room and I was like, I can't wait to do that again. And I was like, this is why I'm an athlete because <laughs> I just beat my body up, but I felt like I dominated that workout and I want to go back out there and do it again. And what is, and we'll get to you in a second, Eric, but what is that, what does that mean for you when, you know, like the, imagining yourself on the starting line in Tokyo, what does that mean for you and your state of mind? It means that I'm here, I made it. There's, there's nothing else that I could do at this point, but to just go, I put in all the work and it, it means everything to be able to be there and know that I was the one selected out of so many people to be able to do this. So um, not only am I going to put everything out there, but um, I'm super grateful for the opportunity and just want to make myself proud, my family and my country proud too. Will you be able to have fun in Tokyo or will it be a job in Tokyo? That's a good question. <laughs> I hope, I hope it'll be fun. Um, with COVID, obviously there's going to be some restrictions, but I think running and seeing the other competitors who I've seen for many different races, um, I think it'll be fun to see them and connect with them again too. Eric, how about, how about you? What, what did COVID do for you? It sounds like you were training on the road instead of training on the track. What did it, how, how did it affect your training and your outlook for, for Tokyo? Um, it was a lot of the same as like what Kim said. Um, there was a lot of figuring out how can I get the best workout in with the limited resources I have right now because all the tracks were closed. Like everything that I was used to I wasn't able to really get to because everything was closed down. So it's like, so let's just go to the drawing board. How, how can I get this workout in? How can I do the best that I can and still have fun with it? So um, after a while, I talked my dad into getting on his bike because I, I went home for a little bit. Um, 
after I left here, I went home for a little bit. So I was like, hey, I could still technically have a training partner. My dad can hop on his bike and keep up with me and kind of push me a little bit to go a little faster or whatever. So, you know, he'd, he'd be on his bike and try to keep up with me and just kind of made it a fun little game for, you know, workouts and stuff. Um, with weights and stuff, we had to get a little, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Creative. Creative. Because, you know, no gyms were uh, open. You couldn't find any workout equipment anywhere in the stores. The, the shelves were just cleared, you know. So I heard some of my, my teammates say, you know, I went and bought a couple 20-pound bags of rice from Costco. And I put them in these little things. And I'm using those as weights or, you know. So just playing around with everything and just, you know, trying to just keep as positive, as positive of a mind as you could possibly have with not knowing what the future holds, you know, when everything shut down. So, um, and then I guess what kept me going is, especially with the relay, because I had so much fun on that relay team, you know, it's like, when we get back to racing, I, I really want to be on this relay team. So that's really what kind of kept me motivated to keep going, because you know, it's like, it's not just me on the relay team. I got three other teammates that are relying on me as well to do my best so we can hopefully get on top of the podium. So didn't want to let them down either. So, you know, there were just all sorts of things going on and just kind of, you know, saying we have an extra year. I'm going to be that much stronger a year later than I, than I was the year before. So, you know, I, I just did everything I could just to, just to, keep going stay positive and do the best I could in the situation we were handed how much of a benefit was it for the two of you to be together in individual pursuits but in common individual pursuits to to be able to share that experience when things blew up and went crazy so we actually actually we spent most of the summer apart because all we heard were these stories about these couples or they're butting heads. They're, <laughs> they're just wanting to strangle each other because they're stuck in the house 24 seven. So she went home a couple of weeks before I left the training center. And I was like, you know what, let me go home for a little while. My, my dad wanted to remodel the house. And, you know, I, I watched the fixer upper and stuff on HGTV all the time. It's like, I want to knock down a wall. So I'm going to go home while they're remodeling the house. I'm going to help them get all that stuff remodeled and train and stuff. So we actually spent what like three, three or four months apart. You know, we were on the phone five out five, ten hours a day every single day. We, yeah. I mean, we were still constantly <laughs> talking to each other. But I think at the end of the day, it was probably the best thing we could have done. Yeah. Because, you know, like I said, we, we didn't want to strangle each other from being together 24-7 and which we are you know. together 24-7 yeah. doing this job. Like we live in the small dorm room and we work out at the same time and you know, we eat at the same time, everything. So we're, we already know what it's like to be around each other 24 seven. So I think it was in a way kind of nice to, to have that the three months apart. And then we came back together right before our anniversary. And like he said, we were on the phone five to 10 hours a day. <laughs> so, so it's almost like we were together. It, yeah, exactly. To be honest. <laughs> what, what are you talking about when you're on the phone for five to 10 hours a day? Uh, so about four hours, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's, we'll, we'll FaceTime each other. So it's like, you know, we're there. So he's there in the middle of the conversations that I'm having with my mom at the time. He's eating dinner on the phone while I'm eating dinner. So like, he's just like, oh, what are you guys having? So I show him what we're having for dinner. Like, it's, it's not really like conversations. It's just like, yeah, we're there. Kind of like we're in person yeah <laughs> I, I got really big into putting puzzles together when this whole thing happened so I was constantly putting puzzles together so I just flipped the camera and I'm like I don't really have much to talk about so watch me put this puzzle together. yeah you know or just stuff you know just normal stuff nothing nothing crazy yeah <laughs> interesting interesting <laughs> okay so do you guys uh I mean you're talking about dinners do you, do you guys cook or, or, I mean, you're at the you're at the training center where you don't have to cook, right? Yeah. So Kim, Kim's the cook. Is that is that how it goes? Yeah. When when we're not living at the training center, yeah, I'm the cook. <laughs> I make the green beans because it's the easiest thing to make, and she does all the hard stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so that's how that works. <laughs> yeah. That is good. So so now, okay, so you, so you made it through COVID and and you survived both both as athletes and as a married couple, you survived. I, I don't know what your what your phone, you know, what your phone bills looked like, but I mean, other <laughs> than that, you, you survived. Yeah. So what are you guys looking for in these last few weeks leading up to Tokyo? What do you have to do? And is it physical? Is it mental? Is it emotional? How, how do you get there and get to that top step of the podium, which is the goal for both of you? For me, um, I know that I need to keep training. I was out for a couple of months with an injury. Um, I tore my hamstring, literally my first race. <laughs> so, yeah. So I was out for a little bit and I was still training, able to do what I could, but um, not training like I should have been. So I know that I need to keep training. And that's the first thing that I told my coach when I was able to run again, like, let's just train. And he's like, you want to compete? I said, no, I know I need to train because I, I definitely have big goals for myself this year. And I think once I see where I want to go or once I know once I get to where I want to go then that's when it'll be there for me mentally and I'll be like okay I'm ready let's go to Tokyo <laughs> and some big goals are you willing to share with us what your big goals are the top of the podium that's the big goal <laughs> big goal 100 and 400 or 400 and or 100 or wh which one okay so I I want to be at the top of the podium for the 100. Um, being in fourth place so many times for the 400, I want to make the podium for the 400. I, I like to stay realistic a little bit. I know I'm, I'm more for our 100 meter dominant. So I getting to getting to the podium in the 400 is that goal and then top of the podium for the 100. All right. And Eric, what about you? What do you what do you need to do? And, and, you know, I mean, it's kind of interesting, even the trials, right, where you had a guy like Daniel Romanchuk coming down into the 100 who, you know, who's really known as a marathon, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but is pretty darn good at 100 as well. So, so, so what is what does that look like for you? I mean, it sounds like the, the, uh, the relay is, is a big priority as well. Oh, yeah. Yep, definitely excited for the relay. Um, for me, I just need to keep working on my starts because especially in a sprint, starts are everything. If you have a bad start, then you're probably not going to be able to catch up. So um, for me, just kind of keep working on starts. Um, everything else, just kind of maintain because it's like Kim mentioned earlier, if you're, if you're not really ready by now, the work's already been done. So if you're not really ready by now, you're not really going to be ready. And um, this season has been one of my best seasons I've ever had. Um, so yeah, just work on starts and just kind of maintain till, till the games. What goes into a good start? I mean, we, we, starting in a wheelchair is really specific, right? Like what, what goes into a good start? Um, fast hands, really, really fast hands, fast, powerful hands and a good reaction time. Um, been kind of struggling with my reaction time lately. It could be a little bit better because um, they have that rule, one false start and you're out. So that's always in the back of my mind, like don't fall start. And I think that's kind of hurting my starts a little bit. So just kind of just keep practicing those starts and, and just kind of get a better reaction time when you hear the gun go off and just power all the way through. I've, I've heard some, some runners talk about, like some of the runners say that they actually close their eyes mm -hmm. at, the, at the set position, you know, ready, set, they close their eyes and wait for that gun and just, just react to it. Do you, do you have any triggers like that? I don't, I hold my breath at the start. So then as I'm powering, it just kind of gives me a little bit more power as you're holding your breath. So. I'll hold my breath probably the first 10, 15, maybe 20 meters of the race. And then just as I'm powering down, just kind of slowly let that breath out. 
So I think that's really all I do, but I, I definitely don't close my eyes. I'm, I'm afraid to do that. <laughs> <laughs> that is funny. That is what well, we talked about that too, that, that Kim got in a racing chair and so we might have to get you to experience a bit more of what Kim has to experience. Yeah. On the track. Honestly, I'm surprised it hasn't happened yet, but it, it, it will. <laughs> it sounds like it will. It sounds like Kim is going yep. to get you on the track with, with some blindfolds or some tape over your glasses or something like that. So you can walk a few, walk a few, uh, you know, do do a few hundreds in, in her shoes, really. Yeah. So you also, I mean, we've talked about a lot of what you're doing as athletes, but you you coach as well, right? And so doing some work with the Challenge Athletes Foundation. How did you get involved with the Challenge Athletes Foundation, and what does it mean to you to be coaches? I'm trying to think. How did we? Yeah, how did we start with? So yeah, yeah. they <laughs> they do a yearly grant every year for for athletes, um, and so I've been getting grants to them for as long as I can remember. Um, how did we actually? I know their headquarters are here in San Diego. Right. How did I'm not, Oh, I think I know. I yeah. Remember. So it just came to me. So we had. Um, uh, a teammate of ours who he's the head of the adapted sports program for um, San Diego College is SDSU. Yeah. So he um, heard that CAF was needing some coaches and he was like, Kim, I know you want to coach. So do you, would you like to coach for CAF? And I said, of course. And so Eric being my driver, <laughs> I, he had to drive me there. So then they, I feel like it almost wasn't really like, he just kind of was there and did it. Kind of fell into it. Yeah. yeah. And then um, that's how one of the other coaches came too, because he came along with us as well. So we, we kind of almost fell into, into coaching and coaching those kids, honestly, it's been so much fun. Um, I've, we've done it for two, three years now and just being able to see the joy on the kids' faces when they're out there running, jumping, pushing, you know, throwing, whatever it may be. Um, it just warms your heart so much because I know that what exactly they're feeling. Cause that's what I went through when I first started track or, doesn't matter what sport it was just being able to do something knowing that you have that sport available to you and you're able to go out there do it on your own and be this independent athlete and um what CAF is doing to to help these kids and open it up and try to be on their um on their high school teams as well I think having that inclusion is so awesome and is opening so many doors for so many kids across the country. So I'm, I'm happy to be a part of it for sure. Do, does it change? Does it help you? I mean, you guys are coaching, right? I mean, obviously you're doing something that's good, but does it help you as athletes to be coaches as well? Yeah, I, I think so because I'm teaching them the drills that I know and I feel like as I try to help them with their form, it takes me back to the basics. And it's like, well, maybe I do need to go back to some basics sometimes and really practice this. And maybe that'll help me to keep my knees up at the last hundred of my 400. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it's helping me in that way for sure. Yeah, same thing for you, Eric. Definitely. Yeah. Cause like she said, it, it just kind of opened your eyes. Like, you know, I'm explaining to these kids the proper way to push a racing chair. And then I'm like, wait, do I actually push that way? Maybe I should push this way. It's a little bit better. Like, it's, <laughs> so yeah. It, so I'm honestly, I'm teaching myself as I'm teaching these kids. So, <laughs> you know, cause once you do it for so long, you just kind of, you kind of forget the basics after a while. So it's, it's a good refresher to go back to the basics yeah. every once in a while put you in that conscious state of mind in terms of what you're doing mm -hmm. and then you're also you're held to a much higher standard too right when you're when you have to do a demonstration you have to do it correctly yeah all the time. <laughs> definitely yeah they, they must love seeing you oh, go ahead eric 
And it's just cool because I know like this is the next generation of our sport. So it's just cool knowing like one day they could be in our shoes or, you know, or even better than what, what my career was. So it's just really cool knowing that, you know, I'm giving them all of my knowledge that I can possibly give and just watch them grow in that sport throughout the years and stuff. So it's, it's very rewarding. Does it blow your blow their mind when you show up in the Bugatti? <laughs> Only I had one. <laughs> uh, what, maybe one day, hopefully. Maybe, maybe one day, a $3 million car. I don't even know. Oh my God. Could, could you actually drive that? It would scare me to death. No, they just let me sit in it. After the fact, once I left, I was like, dang, maybe I should ask, at least ask them, can I start it? You know, but didn't think of about it till after. But yeah, at least I got to sit in it. So. <laughs> Yeah, do you mind if I drop my portable hand controls into this? <laughs> yeah. Don't worry, it's fine. Don't worry, you, you guys will be good. You'll enjoy it. So <laughs> that is funny. Well, this is awesome. Thank you guys for taking time out. We know that this is a, you know, this is your your personal time, and you're also preparing for Tokyo, doing everything you can. But we really appreciate you spending time with us, telling your story. We certainly appreciate you sharing your wisdom with the next generation too. So thank you so much for doing yeah, that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having us on. We had fun. Yeah, it was a blast. <laughs> Good, that's the idea. That is the idea. We wanna do that. And I wanna make sure you guys have fun when you're in Tokyo, get out there, have fun, go fast and get to that top step of the podium. So thanks thank again. You. We'll look forward to seeing you. Uh, for all of you who joined us, thank you so much for joining us. We hope you enjoyed this. If you didn't get to watch the whole thing, it will be on the, it will be archived on the One Revolution page on Facebook. So you can go back to it. We will also edit it and turn it into a traditional podcast, which will be on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, et cetera, all the places you find your podcast. The greatest gift, the greatest compliment that you can pay to us is telling your friends, telling your friends that you love it. Hey, check this out. Go see, they have great guests. They have amazing people, great athletes all this stuff. If you can like us, if you can follow us, you're doing us a great service and we will continue to tell some amazing stories of resilience. So you guys, thanks a ton. Train hard, go fast, and we'll see you soon. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you.